949-2568. The Community Calendar is produced by members of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. Send your listing at least four weeks in advance to KPFA, Box 51, 1929 Martin Luther King Jr. Way in Berkeley, California, 94704. Or email us at calendar at kpfa.org. Tell us if your event is wheelchair accessible. To hear this calendar again, call 510-848-6767, extension 621. This calendar is also online at kpfa.org. Good evening. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF Fresno, 97.5 K248BR Santa Cruz, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 7.01 p.m. Stay tuned for Apex Express. Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to another edition of Apex Express. I'm your host and producer for tonight's show, Preeti Mangla Shekhar. Tonight's show is about reflections and report backs. We begin our show talking to two young South Asian American activists, Shrida Horgada and Satvik Nair, alums of this year's Bay Area Solidarity Summer, an annual summer camp that trains immigrant and American South Asian youth in social justice organizing, followed by a report back on the National Queer Asian Pacific Islander Conference that was held in San Francisco last month. We speak with organizer Tracy Nguyen from API Equality, Northern California, and one of the organizers, Kudai Tanvir. Stay tuned. So we begin tonight's show by spotlighting BASE or Bay Area Solidarity Summer, a political action camp to cultivate young South Asian American activists aged 18 to 23. This camp brings together every year, every August, typically over 25 South Asian American youth and a dedicated core of activist volunteers spend months poring over every aspect of this camp from the curricula to its trainers. Here to tell us a bit about how their experience of this year's camp are two wonderful activists uh, based here in Berkeley, Satvik Nair, a third year undergraduate at UC Berkeley, originally from San Jose. Satvik is a first generation Indian American with roots in Odisha and Kerala. Um, Odisha is a state in eastern India and Kerala in the south. Uh, he's studying computer science and cognitive science and is interested in equitable education and performing arts and applications of computing to the social sciences and humanities. His work includes spearheading the creation of an open letter on anti-blackness from a South Asian perspective in collaboration with activists, writers and academics from across the U.S. promoting data science education at both UC Berkeley and in India, as well as other organizing. Wonderful. Welcome, Satvik. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Great. And then we have Shrita Horda Goda. Am I saying your name right? Yes. Yes. A first generation Sri Lankan woman currently attending Berkeley City College and plans to earn her undergraduate in political economics and sociology. She's worked with several human rights organizations, including Amnesty International and UN Women, on various campaigns to promote our awareness around issues, uh, including sustainable fashion and violence against women. She hopes to become an educator and to eventually open a school for young children in Sri Lanka. Ambitious, both of you. Welcome to our show, Sridhar. Thank you. I appreciate that. Great. So let's um, begin with Satvik. Uh, so tell us about how you found out about BASE and, um, you know, uh, paint a picture of it for us. Yeah, of course. So I actually found out about BASE from one of the projects that you were describing earlier. So I had been in contact with one of the key organizers and I believe founders of BASE, Onirvan Chatterjee, when we were working on this open letter project on anti-blackness. And when I came to UC Berkeley, because I did this in the summer before my first year of college, 
I saw that Owner Vaughn was also based in, at Berkeley, and so I got in contact with him, and like later on he told me about bass, which I thought was a really important experience, it, or it would be a really important experience for me as I was interested in a lot of these causes, but didn't really get a lot of opportunities in my planned academic coursework and uh, activities on campus. And as for what base looked like, so generally participants would um, go through a couple workshops in which they in in which base organizers invited a lot of uh, speakers who would facilitate sessions on various topics such as um, labor organizing or other important top topic areas that are covered in this kind of work, as well as key skills such as creating and organizing direct actions that would be applicable regardless of the causes that people were organizing around. Great. We'll dive a little bit deeper into the camp um, as we continue talking. Shrita, what was it for you? How did you find out and uh, what was your quick snapshot of the camp? Um, well, I unfortunately didn't know of any South Asian activist groups or anything around. I didn't even know there was things going on um, to help South Asian folks here in the United States and back home. So I actually saw this on Facebook. Um, I forgot who of my friends who shared this, but I'm so grateful to them that they did because um, I saw it, I read about it, I was like, wow, this sounds really cool. It's a space for South Asian folks just like myself who care about social justice and who want to make a difference um, here and in our countries of origin. So I applied and I luckily got in. Um, it was an amazing five days for me. It changed my life. Um, and uh, I'd love to dive more um, throughout this. But yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. So why don't you tell us about uh, Paint a Picture to our listeners, um, including hopefully some who are South Asian youth, maybe thinking about base or curious to know more about base. What were, uh, how were the five days for you? Um, well, each day it was jam packed with different workshops and seminars on different topics like war and imperialism. Um, Southwick mentioned the labor movements and um, how to organize, how to storytell. It was all these different things on um, kind of our history as South Asians here in the United States, different issues that could be going on um, back home. Um, and how to organize and how to make a difference and how to um, activate or organize the community onto making an impact for um, these different issues. And so each day we kind of went through all of these different topics that were actually quite heavy um, and very hard to kind of revisit and rethink about kind of all these things that have happened to us as a marginalized community. Um, each day was very, very, very heavy for me. I ended up going to bed very late each night because um, me and some colleagues would be staying up just talking and decompressing about all of these things that we have to go through. You know, this was a safe space for us, um, our S South Asians who care about these issues, who are very aware and educated on these issues. So um, a lot of awareness had happened, a lot of educating had happened, and a lot of, just a lot happened. I don't, it, you know, and I, it'll be things that I'll be reflecting on for the rest of my life. And um, yeah. Great. And Sathvik, um, you've already were engaged somewhat, right, before you before this camp happened. Yeah. So what were some of your own aha moments building on what Shrida just talked about? Yeah, so going back to the South Asian American history, it was really amazing because like I had done some readings on, on this topic for, before. So it wasn't just amazing to see like what data actually what the data actually looked like because um I actually went and looked up some some data with Anurvan's help at, about like cens the census in the year 1940 and conventionally we talk about South Asians as like coming here post 1965 which was when the US government lifted a lot of regulations on Asian immigration but in reality a lot of people from British India or what, what was then British India and like what's now India and Pakistan actually came to the farms of the Central Valley which resembled their homelands in Punjab and then they intermarried with um, Mex mostly Mexican women and they created their own sort of culture around there so it wasn't it, it was great to talk about this idea with a lot of fellow a lot of my peers as well as other people interested in this topic and also to see like really how the data also agreed with a lot of the literature and the readings that are out there and i would say some other moments 
that really st- stood out to me were um, probably the process of the direct action workshop because we learned about a really, really um, involved process that goes into planning a lot of actions and protests and demonstrations. And having gone to UC Berkeley post November 2016, I I had seen a lot of these kinds of actions, some of them which had gone violent, some of which were peacefully executed. So as a result, in fact, I was even taken out of my own class during one of these actions. So, And this class didn't have anything to do with a topic like imperialism or white supremacy. It was just, it just happened to be going on outside one of the demonstrations. So now it was really, really interesting to see like, what kind of planning goes into a lot of these successful actions as well as what sort of constitutes an unsuccessful or ineffective direct action. Great. Any aha moments for you, Shridhar, that you would like to talk about, including some of the readings you talked about? There was a lot to read and pour over. Yeah, yeah. Um, You know, there's many, many things that I've been trying to reflect on, but I think one of the hardest things that I had to think about and decompress afterwards was actually at the very end of camp was the South Asian history radical walking tour. Um, we, you know, we're all walking in a group and this is a tour that's, um, been organized by Anurvan and, um, his wife, I believe, his pre- partner, Bernali. Bernali, yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, so they kind of go throughout Berkeley and they kind of demonstrate different events in history that have happened in Berkeley and different South Asian activists and things that they've done to kind of um, make this a better place for us. Um, and during this walking tour, we were all walking. It's a group of, you know, South Asian folks. And um, this is actually my first time walking around with a group of South Asians, actually, in my entire life. Um, and so I uh, did pay attention to the looks that we we're getting from different people. Um, and it was it was very uncomfortable for me, um, especially this being my first time walking around in the general public with um, folks that I share this connection with. And... Um, at one point during the tour, um, a white man comes up to us and, you know, he tries to stop Anurvan or tries to stop the group to just add something to what was happening. And um, to make this long story short, it just ended up spiraling out of control and him yelling at the group, yelling at Anurvan, calling him racist, calling him names and just all of these things. And, you know, the group kind of just walked it off. We kind of, or folks laughed it off. And I, um, I was one of the, only people that actually stopped and started hysterically crying i was so shook i was so upset by what had just happened seeing this man's face seeing him attack someone who i personally just got very close with and i admire and i just i i was so upset by this and i also thought about everyone else's reaction of just kind of having to laugh this off because there's already scar tissue developed there right these are things that south asian folks have to deal with on a regular basis and i was I guess fortunate enough to that being my first time at 20 years old, but then also seeing like this is really bad that we have to go through these things, and it's it was just very upsetting and um, very raw. But that was a moment where I think about even in a place as progressive as Berkeley, you know, we're not necessarily safe. You know, these are things we have to think about and talk about all the time and keep working towards, um, and just helping me realize that I still need to do a lot of work to help educate a lot of folks out there and how to have solidarity with different communities. Absolutely. I'm sorry that happened. It sounds really disturbing and kind of surprising and uh, disappointing that 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 can happen in a progressive town like Berkeley. Um, Yet it did, right? Um, So um, going back to your own background in human rights, um, I'm curious, how did you connect the dots with a lot of issues you've already been working on to what base educated you on? Yeah, so I, you know, I growing up, I used to think I wasn't affected by any issues and I didn't really have any awareness in what's happened in Sri Lanka or how that connects to my level of empathy for the world and what I want to do with the world. So a lot of the issues I was working on were things that um, were more underrepresented in the United States and um, just different issues globally, not so much within my own community. And I wasn't really sure 
what was happening in you know Sri Lanka, what kind of activist movements were happening there. I wasn't really sure what was happening here or what has ever happened here. Um, so based to learn about the first South Asian folks that came here, the first groups that um, really made a difference in how we are looked at, how we're perceived, and how we navigate this country and this space um, was really eye-opening and amazing for me to actually learn, wow, like there's been so many people that have been working towards this and have led to kind of my work and what I want to continue doing. Um, it was truly amazing to actually learn about all of this and to think about, you know, the things that I want to continue doing. And I definitely want to focus more on helping Sri Lankan folks and going back to Sri Lanka and kind of, you know, bringing awareness to issues like women's rights and, you know, how to end the heteropatriarchy and all of these different things. And it's a scary thing to talk about. It's a scary thing to do, but um, I definitely think it's possible. And um, yeah, I... There's, yeah, this just really helped me reevaluate what I want to do and help focus it back onto people that have helped me. Right, that's great. Um, and then Satvik, for you as a student of the sciences, um, how different was a space like base for you, and and um, what were some of the uh, you know um, what were some of the places where you could connect some of the dots uh, around issues that you're already working on to what you learned and. Um, and I think there were also a few more participants who were in the sciences. So how is that for you to be, for you all to be in this space, which is very different from what you typically have in the science, in science classes? Right. And especially one of my majors, computer science, which is extremely male heavy. So usually, especially uh, Asian, Asian lesser than white, but... I think like there, there's like more Asian folks at, at Berkeley. But anyways, the point is that in spaces that are usually occupied by students in this major, I feel comfortable because there, there's like people who look like me. But here, I was actually one of the only two two men, and actually the only straight cis Hindu man. So I felt like this experience was really a great way to get out of my comfort zone. And um, I think probably the biggest takeaway that I had from base and something that I'm going to keep on reflecting on, I feel like for the rest of my life even, is just like the amount of respect that I develop for like women of color in general, especially especially because the space was populated by so many, so many folks. And because I felt like being able to listen and like absorb and like talk about these ideas really helped me realize um, really how much like women of color go through, especially in this country. And this is like everybody ranging from my family me- members. I I felt like I really appreciated my mother a lot more. <laughs> to yeah, to just That's a like good anyone. testimonial. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, and um, I, I guess like when it comes to connecting these ideas to the, to the sciences, um, first of all, obviously like with data, like the like the work that I like eventually see myself of going into, like using these skills to sort of like help bring light to historical issues was one idea, but really I feel like. I sort of got more clarity on how I would involve the scientific or rather social justice work in in my everyday career. So a lot of the time I felt like I really wanted to find like that perfect balance between um, my interests and my skills, but I really wanted to or I also realized that it's also that it, it is indeed possible with like a nine to five job with not only um, some of the organizers, but actually some of the participants who were like working and um, doing organizing on the side. And I actually met a couple of people who were like that at a at the community mixer, in which um, a lot of alumni from base, as well as just like local South Asian activists, are invited. And then it it's amazing; it spans several generations. So it it was amazing to see like. Um, somebody who was like my father's age working in this field um, and really being aware of these kinds of social issues. So I would I would say 
finally, that um, if we're looking at direct connections with my like my line of work as well as like social justice issues, I would say that one of the workshops actually really really connected with what I could probably see myself doing it. In fact, so this was the workshop on labor organizing that I mentioned earlier, and as sort of an example that they used for us to think through and see what we would do in this situation was actually a strike done by security workers at Apple who were trying to negotiate higher wages and salaries and really trying to figure out where people who are sort of, quote, unquote, more respected in the in, in this chain in of command would sort of fit in with this kind of organizing was something that, like, really, that was, like, really enlightening. And I certainly feel like I could actually see myself doing that in the future. Great. Uh, it's good to have role models as you, you know, uh, figure out what you want to do next and how you want to integrate all this, all your learnings into your life. Um, Daisy parents, I realize listening to both of you can be notoriously liberal, neoliberal and or, you know, get conservative and not want you to go to such spaces. Right. Did either of you, your parents, were they cool with you going away to this camp? Uh, um, I actually my father lives in Sri Lanka. And uh, I briefly told him about it, but I didn't get a chance to really dive into it with him. And I know he would have been very happy that I actually had a space like this to attend. And I think he also would have been... um, I was thinking about all the family members and all the people I I love in my life that are older than 23 or younger than 18 that cannot attend base, that really need to attend base. Um, I think there was a lot of aha moments for everyone, and I think so much of the curriculum, so much that was taught, so much of the community of uh, not just the trainers and core staff, but the the attendees, um, our cohort, they shared so much wisdom and insight that I feel like, man, I just wish uh, the people I love that, you know, don't have the space to talk about these things could be in this space to just listen and hear like these stories. Um, I think, yeah, my father would have definitely benefited from something like this. He was, if he definitely, I need to dive into it with him and tell him about all the things that I learned. Um, my mom, very, very conservative lady. She's actually, um, a Trump supporter, and uh, I didn't really talk to her about it. I kind of did. She was calling me, and I was like, yeah, I'm with a bunch of brown people talking about social justice issues. She didn't respond. So <laughs> I think that kind of speaks to how she feels. But I, um, there's a lot of trauma, of course, she's been through going, coming and growing up here, and um, there's things that we I want to dive into with her to, to kind of talk about maybe why she has these feelings. Um, and I think there's a lot of education I've gotten from base that will help me have those conversations with her. Yeah. Great. I wish one of the core organizers of the camp could have joined us. Um, I didn't get to reach out in time, but I um, really want to give a big shout out to them because this is like months and months of um, literally a labor of love. Um, that they pour in to make this happen and uh, really make this incredible space, right? Like one of the things I always realize is we live in a time of so much is virtual and you can go online or go on YouTube and learn practically anything. But there is something called community and building that space physically, right? Coming together, sharing a meal, um, learning with other peers, which you all did it, right? There were about 25 people this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that's, that must have been something. So, um, any other closing thoughts as we wrap up our conversation? Uh, everyone, tell any South Asian you know who is between the ages of 18 or 23 or younger than 18 who can go to base, apply to base, go. Tell everyone. Tell everyone, go. It's the most amazing thing that ever happened to me. Um, Great. Very grateful. That's solidaritysummer.org. Uh, for those of our listeners who want to find out more about BASE, maybe donate to next year's BASE and um, really, um, you know, spread the word to your South Asian friends and, you know, people who have kids in that age group. Any other closing thoughts, Satvik? Yeah, I definitely think that it was really, really helpful to find a community of people who did not only, like, think similarly to me, but also, like, we're, we were able to, like, share a lot of perspectives and best practices. And I think anybody, again, echoing what she, though, said, between the ages of 18 and 23 to apply to to base. And I would say that it's really helpful regardless, 
if whether or not you like actually actively seek this out in your line of work or like it's just something you think about and like you want to get yourself involved in definitely apply and i think you're like you definitely will get a lot out of it i hope you'll tell a lot of your stem pals to you know especially <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> people in the sciences uh cis men i, th- I think need to be yes. more involved um especially as we work on issues around violence against women and so on i think we need more um well thank you so much for both of you to both of you for making time uh, school just started so i acknowledge that it's a busy time uh and hope to have you back as you build on this work and do more activist uh, joyous activist uh work Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you for having us. Great. You're listening to Apex Express on 94.1 FM KPFA. We'll be back after a short music break. Dashte tanha Tere 
that was a track Dashte Tanhai um uh from the Pakistani Cook Studio. Up next I have two special guests uh on air um Tracy Nguyen from API Equality Northern California and Khudai Tanveer an organizing fellow with NCAPIA which is the which is an acronym for the National Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance and they held a uh, their conference in San Francisco last month a conference a special forum that happens once every 3 years and this was a robust robust and wonderful forum that brought together i want to say over 500 lgbt api immigrant and american intergenerational um communities so here to tell us more about this forum for those of us who missed it and some of the takeaways from it are tracy and khudai are you here with us on air on the phone Yes. Hi, Pritha. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Hi Kudai. Great. Thank you for making time. Um, so let's start with Kudai, who's further away from us on the East Coast. Uh, Kudai, tell us a little bit about uh, Encapia, the conference. Um, let me also begin. Uh, let me also give our listeners a little bit of context by reading your amazing bio. Khudai is an organizing fellow at the at Encapia and she they she they go by she they and is currently attending um university at the Virginia Commonwealth University studying gender sexuality and women's studies as well as political science with a minor in global education and Khudai has been working with queer and trans people of color on campus and beyond doing wonderful work including being part of a steering committee of the tunnel of oppression an interactive auditory and visual tunnel that aims to teach its attendants about oppression on campus in everyday life by walking them through simulations of those experiences this sounds amazing kadai and um you also attended the east coast solidarity summer we just had a couple of um alums from bay area solidarity summer share their reflections about base this year so um so you just seem to be a tremendous organizer and activist so welcome to share your insights on encapia thank you preeti for that amazing introduction <laughs> um, i could go on it's a, such a an illustrative bio why so well why don't you begin by telling us a little bit about uh the forum this year and how it was for organizing it yeah um so the conference had almost at this point 700 people um come out to it from all over the US and folks internationally um that all came under like in um San Francisco and it was actually amazing right because it happens every 3 years so it's every 3 years you get a chance to come together in community and this is the biggest and most amazing event that I have personally ever been to and just the biggest like queer API conference that uh, like as far as I know about has ever come together um and It was like right there's so much community and revolutionary in different kinds of ways. So specifically the part that I was done a lot was getting youth to come out to this conference. And we identified youth as like anyone under the age of 21 that was queer API, queer trans API. And there's almost like 20 plus youth there. We like all of these young folks were able to come out nationally to this conference, fully supported, fully housed, fully like fed and everything. We were taking steps to politicize and like being community. I think that's one of the biggest things that like has come from Encapia is that everyone was able to come in their authenticity and be supported in such elaborate ways to get there. Whether that's whether that's funding to like actually just get to conference in terms of flights or housing, there was a lot of community housing happening. Folks from San Francisco were willing to house people. All of our volunteers from APEN were acting amazing and like. folks who lived in the area and were willing to dedicate their time, their energy to making sure that people in their city, you know, the people that were visiting their city were fully helped and prepared and like felt like home. And so yeah, I think that's one of the biggest things that came out of this conference is that the idea was to grow home together and we really did that. Great. Um I want to talk more about the some of the sessions and the conversations that took place. at this forum you said 700 plus people came to it um 600 plus but almost 700 i believe wow. tracy will have a better number for you yeah up next we have yeah, tracy like- oh wait 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 i need to introduce you before we jump into our um mm-hmm. so tracy who's from san jose california grew up with refugee parents from vietnam and defines um 
themselves as a driven community organizer with a creative and entrepreneurial spirit. And Tracy holds a BA in Media Studies and Ethnic Studies from UC Berkeley and works in the nonprofit primarily to primarily working at the intersections of refugees, rights of refugees, immigrants, workers, women, youth, LGBTQ and incarcerated individuals. And uh, so Tracy, you are uh, one of the main organizers of the conference, so I know it was an incredible incredible labor of love. So tell us a bit about um Encapia this year. Um and um how it how it was for you yeah um thank you so much um so i'm from the bay area and the in Capia only the conference only happens every three years so when we heard it was coming to the bay i was really excited to feature a lot of what the this bay area represents you know it's a home to so much of lgbt people of color movement history the home of civil rights and ethnic studies fight the home of the Asian American movement, the feminist movement, and also home to our bustling technology, booming technology industry. So meaning that it was like one of the most expensive cities in the world um, to 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 put a, conf- a, a grassroots nonprofit conference on in such an expensive city was kind of a contradictory and challenge in itself. Um, but regardless, we have you know half the attendees were local, which meant over 350 people came from out of state and out of the country. Even uh, there, were, there were international guests from Japan, Bangladesh, um, India, China, Vietnam, um, and it, it was just really, really wholesome and and really, for lack of a better word, diverse. There were just so many people from different backgrounds. Um, you know, we have people from different class, different gender, different age. Different, different re- religions, regions, uh, different accessibility needs, um, different languages, even, and so I think that it's such a feat to have to put to try to put on a conference um, when there there's just so many different people to to cater to, or to so many different people to collaborate with and build with, um, and so cultivating a, a space like that for was challenging, but also also really beautiful, um, and it made me think about like, you know, what are we what are we building power for in this kind of context? Um, is it so that people can walk away with a certain feeling of empowerment and hope? Is it so that we sign X amount of signatures on a postcard for an action, or is it like prioritizing accessibility in such a way that people don't have to worry about getting their needs met? They don't have to ask for their needs that that their needs are already provided and met before they even come. But I think to me, like, the building power piece was about the struggle that it felt like, like a beautiful struggle. And and earlier this month after the conference, I would have said that perhaps our community, like, lacked interdependence. But but now that I'm reflecting on it, I think that our community as an LGBT API, which are two very diverse, two very big umbrellas, I think as a community, we're actually really independent, interdependent, I'm sorry, interdependent. Because it means that we're willing to get on the mic and share, um, you know, live time, our feedback or our grievances, share our celebration of the conference or share our frustrations. And I, what I witnessed was that there are a lot of people who are willing to step up in that way because our theme was about growing home, right? And I think people really took to that to heart that this conference space where they're home because for a lot of people this is a home that they've never experienced before that they never get access to in their hometown or home country um and so for for the fact that people have stepped up to share to authentically share their feelings whether it was positive or negative or neutral um it meant, it meant that people really cared about the home that they were occupying and it cared about progressing our home challenging our home but also cleaning up our home and not like leaving coming and going and leaving the dirty dishes behind as a metaphor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Kudai, uh, coming back to you, you, uh, you've been a part of Encapia's NK- community and attended previous conferences. So speak to us about how this space was significant to you and what are some of the key intersections that, that this year's forum tried to surface and engage with? Yeah, absolutely. So I have not actually been to other, like, um, as in, like, another Encapia conference, but Encapia holds different, there's always a convening every summer. We've held convergences throughout all the states, and we've held summits, et cetera. And I think something that conference managers do really well, as you're talking about, was, like, meet those intersections. So 
one of the panels that we had was about intersectionality and all the different kinds of work people were doing. So all of these organizations are doing all this amazing work, such as like PRISM doing Southeast deportation work, got to come together, bond with folks about what it took to like make sure that this wasn't happening in our community. APINC was doing a lot of work about car- like carrying our historical narratives and like making sure those stories are here. Utopia doing a lot of the work with like Pacific Islander folks and making sure that their folks are well caught up with. It's really about bringing all those folks together and actually valuing the community and how diverse we are by bringing them together. So saying that, hey, like we're all part of this one community and all of these issues impact us in different ways. For instance, immigration, right? We all have our own stories of immigration to our own countries and yet somehow we all manage to come together and be like, no, we're down to fight for our people in every capacity and that happens in spaces like this. Right. And Tracy, what about what were some of the sessions or um you know the plenaries and the workshops there were like I don't know several I want to say almost hundreds of them but um what were some of those that stood out to you the ones that you got to attend and got to shape? Um that's yeah that's when you ask you know as a conference coordinator you don't actually get to attend any of the programming um but i can tell you from the conference coordinator um perspective like what we had to offer right we opened up uh, our uh, rsp for workshop proposals early in february and what we got was you know a transformative justice 101 workshop like uh, addressing police brutality in southeast asian communities um asian americans in the media representation the power of networking um, organizing skills workshop, history workshops, uh, how to tell your story, um, you know, what's happening in Japan and China in terms of LGBT rights and human rights, um, and also and the evolution of the right wing, like how do we study um, people who disagree with us or are not in favor of our communities and, you know, the way we live our lives. Um, and we also offer, like, special rooms, like, there was a barber shop in the actual building where queer LGBT API barbers gave cuts to LGBT API folks. And there was a wellness room. There was a film screening room. And um, there was a 600-person banquet at a Chinese restaurant Saturday night. Oh, and there was a beautiful arts night on Friday, too, where we featured local and national LGBT API spoken word artists, singers, dancers, trans um drag performances and, and and that was that was really beautiful um but for me like what was exciting was because as a, a bay area organizer i i have access to so many of these conversations i have access to so many of these workshop topics and and even like people and role models and leadership um it was exciting for me to see so many people fly in and witness that for the first time right um so to hear about people coming out like coming out at the conference itself or to hear parents uh, deepen their allyship for for the LGBT community or to hear um, someone from uh, China uh, say that you know when I go back to my country I'm going to create the space again um, I'm going to recreate the space for my own community um, so I think for me it's just like witnessing the impact it has on so many people um, with such diverse topics it was really exciting. Yeah, and one of the things I also appreciated about the forum, many things, but one of the key things was that you brought in a lot of international participants to really discuss what's happening in the global south and countries back home in Asia and South Asia. And and sometimes it was not easy because visas also were denied, I know, in a couple of cases. So was that an intentional uh, way to make this forum like global or transnational? And um, I'm, and I'm, I'm was wondering if maybe Kodai could talk about the mo- the international plenary that looked at, um, you know, uh, LGBT issues beyond the U.S.? Yes, absolutely. Um, I actually think Tracy would be a better person to talk about this because it helped a lot of the organizing for that. Okay. Tracy, do you want to talk about that? Um, that's funny because I was going to punch it back to you but actually we're actually should be punching it to sasha who's our organizing director um sasha 
uh, Sasha's role is to, um, they, they travel the whole country working with different regions and different member groups of the, the National Federation. Um, but this past year, Sasha actually deliberately traveled internationally to meet with these folks um, one-on-one. So I know that when Sasha was in Southeast Asia, you know, Sasha hit, uh, went to Vietnam <clears throat> and met with... Um, this uh, a f- a famous uh, Vietnamese athlete who started her own LGBT nonprofit. Um, she, uh, Sasha went to Bangladesh and met with some of the um, LGBT organizers on the ground there. Um, so a lot of building up to this panel was um, having these on the ground relationships. And so it was like the first time that we had such a, a huge international uh, presence. And, and, you know, I think a lot of these relationships, um, people just were so excited to, to know that there was a conference such as this and to meet such a bigger, a big uh, community in the U.S. that, um, yeah, we supported folks in booking their flights. And we had one of our uh, volunteer organizers create a whole, um, a whole tour for them uh, that actually started Tuesday of the conference where they got to visit the cities, uh, visit the San Francisco. Visit San Francisco, visit the Castro and the LGBT museums, um, uh, visit Chinatown and hear about the Chinatown history, and then um, uh, had a couple of tracks that were based on the the international panelists providing some workshops around their home countries, and and that led up to a Saturday's plenary where everyone was on the panel talking about um, the work they were doing overseas. Great. On the heels of this discussion, I hope we can bring um, edited plenaries to our show in the following months. Uh, some of them were, I, I got to stay for the opening plenary and one of that was really enriching and really wonderful to hear um, such a mixed group of, you know, like folks from here, folks from abroad and intergenerational youth and, you know, just being in conversation with each other and learning and building on each other. Um were there any? Would either of you uh, be able to share any key takeaways or aha moments for you as you went about, you know, either attending sessions or talking to people or you know people who came in to this conference? Kudai, do you want to go? Yeah. Um, so for a lot of folks, this was the first time that they got to live the intersections of being both. QT and API, right? So they got a chance to be Asian Pacific Islander and a chance to be queer trans and be around people with the same experiences. Um, for instance, like I went to a South Asian caucus and it was almost 50 to 100 folks that, you know, were talking about parents and talking about what it means to like be South Asian and talking in our like languages from home. And it was just so affirming to have the space in which there wasn't just one part of you that you were holding, but so many different parts of you that came together. And there were other folks in that room that could also echo those emotions and feelings. And I think the other thing that seems really important is this conference in all capacities was so politicized, right? Like all of us are bringing our identities into it, whether from abroad or from here, and really figuring out how to mobilize around it and figuring out what we needed to do to secure the future that we wanted to see for us, for our future generations, for our parents, et cetera. So, yeah, I think those are, like, some of the key things for me that came up. <laughs> mm-hmm. Tracy, did you want to add to that? Um, yeah. Uh, an aha moment for me as a coordinator, um, you know, like I meant, as I mentioned before, the, the, the term LGBT is a diverse umbrella on its own. The term API is a diverse umbrella on its own as well. And so together we have this, ridiculous <laughs> umbrella that we that we are connected by as a through polit- identity politics um so what you ex- what we i experienced is that you know i'll see you know one group will want to see one thing but the, the another group wants to see the exact opposite um and and because we're clumped up in this way um at this junction of so many identity points um i, I think what it means to be an lgbt Q API family is that we have to be ready to exercise a certain heart and head muscle, right? Um, we have to be open and compassionate, yet, um, yet, uh, uh, you know, um, advocate for ourselves when we need to. We need to be radical in our politics, yet have the skills to move people along the spectrum. We can be angry, but also we can be loving, and we can be triggered, but we can also be healing. And so I think that really like having everyone in one home 
700 people. Um, I think that really is a te- the, the testament to why so many LGBT API leaders are on the forefront of movements, right? The complexity we hold in navigating our personal identities, but also navigating our interpersonal identities, and uh, above all that, navigating our community um, dynamics and politics, it, it, it's, it's so heavy, yet mm-hmm. it pushes our analysis and pushes our politics in a really, um, in a really deep way. So I, I think what I witnessed at this conference was a, a huge concentration of all of that coming together and um you know a lot of it was hurtful and a lot of it was liberating at the same time and so i think i'm still sitting with that and trying to reflect on what that means for us moving forward as a community um connected by this identity but also like as a community who really yearns to be a movement movement with each other in a deeper way absolutely and uh, when you were talking about the hurt i'm hearing that there's a lot of challenges right and including not just organizing a conference but some of the issues that it surfaces and the difficulty to talk about it and engage with it critically would either of you will be willing to share or break that down for our listeners what what are some of the challenges and both opportunities you know um both in this current political moment which is extremely challenging and frustrating but also uh and it's also an incredible opportunity given the tools of technology and other things that we have to um take things forward Dad, you want to go? Yeah. Um so I think the biggest piece for me and something that I learned both at this conference and every space that Incapia has done so far is getting our folks where everyone's at, right? So like somehow being able to like pull in our folks to that level of like education and like navigation of politics and navigation of like what harms who and how are we how are we coming together around it to the point where we're all on the same page right because we're coming from such diverse backgrounds we're trying to you know unlike a lot of other folks like we're trying to like carry our families and carry our legacy at the same time as we are trying to build forward into the future so i think that's been one of the biggest challenges for me is like how do we get everyone on the same page? So what does that take? Well, also making sure that we're not leaving people behind, right? Like building out this future that we have planned while making sure that we're taking all of those legacies and those histories that we've been raised with and all of those like complexities, right? Because we're coming from, a lot of us are coming from like immigrant homes, people who have moved here very recently and like trying to navigate the U.S. political system while also navigating what our relationships look like at home, what these motherlands look like, what our parents are dealing with versus what we're dealing with and et cetera. And I think, yeah, that's the biggest thing for me is like bringing everyone together onto the same page or making sure that like we're centered in a place in which we're not disposing of others and instead really building this movement. Tracy, any, would you like to add to that? I really appreciated your um, um, insights, Khudai. That's absolutely true. Um, you know it's uh, very hard to walk the talk and uh, really build solidarity that's authentic and that's a lot of work and um it's a work in progress for sure mm-hmm. absolutely yeah and that's for me um i think what the opportunity is 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 the radical healing that i've been talking about um i think there's such a presence in us in our community and understanding or I think we're really building the tools to identify where our hurt is and where um, where we can stop our cycles of trauma um, but also a lot of us are still learning those tools and still trying to evolve the tools um, so whether it shows up in our organizing itself whether it shows up in us uh, um, shows up interpersonally with amongst our, our each other or whether it shows up like in our own homes with our families um, I think what I what I see is that everyone's really invested in making it a priority to show up um, in their in their best the best versions of themselves in the most healed place that we can, um, and and even when it hurts, I think there's a trust that the, the the part part of the pain moving through the pain moving through the struggle is um the investment of, of towards liberation um uh, especially now when it's so hard to hold all the pieces uh that is our you know administration our community our our ecosystem of of, of uh, discrimination and oppression um but also like remembering that there's a lot of hope and light in the way that we heal ourselves um for the resili- for the resilience of our community and the longevity of our movement 
Absolutely. And as we wrap up our conversation, do you either of you have any closing thoughts? Um, how can people find out more about NCAPIA and maybe support it for those of you know those who want to be more supportive and also get more engaged with NCAPIA? Yeah, absolutely. So we have we have all the social media. We have Facebook, Instagram, etc. You can follow us on there. We're consistently posting about all the like movement work we're doing. And in a lot of cities, we have membership org, right? So if you identify as someone that is queer, trans, API, there's so many. There's almost four, there's 47 plus organizations throughout 11, 12 states in the United States that have Encapia bases or organizations that. Um, are under the Federation of Encapia. So if you want to get involved with any of those things, there are local places, there's ways to get involved nationally. Um, you can reach out to any one of us. Um, so you can maybe we can figure out a way to circulate emails or anything else that might be useful to folks so that they can get in contact with us if needed. Um, but yeah, completely down to continue holding space with folks and so excited to be on the show. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Khudai, do you have any other final thoughts? Oh, that was that was me. Oh, that was you. Sorry, <laughs> I, <laughs> I do have um, yeah, final Tracy. Yes, uh, yeah. So every summer we do convene as as an Encapia uh, conference is the most uh, accessible open invitation um, convening. But uh, next year we'll have our leadership summit for member groups only, and the year after that we'll have um, regional summits. And so, um, you know, if you're interested in getting involved. Uh, there's an opportunity for every summer for you to be part of this family and every summer it kind of feels like a family reunion. Um, and, and I think uh, there is an opportunity for folks to really build out what this home can continue to mean for us. Um, to be able to have a home to come to every summer, I think is really magical. And I've been to the events since 2011, so I can attest to like how beautiful it is to return to a space like this in, a di- in different ways every summer. Um, so yeah, you can reach out and get involved uh, through all the ways that that could I mention and also in the big ways um, for the, all the summer convening. Okay. And that's that can be found on the website, on NCAPIA's website and social media. NCAPIA.org. NCAPIA.org. Okay. okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you both of you for making time. I know it's been an incredibly busy time and uh, Tracy, I know you wear so many hats so really appreciate you uh, carving time out for this and thank you, Kudai. You're, you know, one of those young upcoming, you know, queer leaders who give us a lot of hope in this current political climate so uh, keep doing what you're doing and um, you know all the best both of you thank you for having us so much great thank you so much and uh, that's uh, that brings us to the end of tonight's show um I want to also let you know that Apex Express now is on Instagram so you can find us on Instagram at Apex Express uh, I also want to include a quick shout out to the prison strike that started on Tuesday the 21st, the nationwide strike. Um, one of my colleagues at Apex Express urged me to do a shout out for that. It's an incredible strike. So if you haven't heard about it yet, go online and Google it. It's the largest nationwide strike, open prison labor strike um, that's underway. Um Big shout out to all the incarcerated people who are participating in it bravely and fearlessly. And um, yeah, and then and uh, Apex Express uh, is produced by Marie Che, Tara Darabji, Salima Hamirani, me, Preeti Mangla Shekhar, Robin Takiyama, Lindsay Oda, Natasha Harden, Eunice Kwan, Miko Lee, Ayami, and Jelena Kian Lee. Our theme music is by Asian Crisis. I've been your host and producer, Preeti Mangla Shekhar, with Carla West on uh the on our board up uh, the, our board up uh tune back in it's 7 p.m next thursday for another edition of apex express on kpfa no one can tell the story of hip-hop in recent black womanhood the way joan morgan tells it Hard Knock Radio, KPFA, and Marcus Books are bringing that feminist, that fire-spitting high priestess to Oakland. That's right, the author of When Chicken Heads Come Home to Roost, and the smoking new book, She Begat This, 20 Years of the Miseducation of Lauren Hill. Joan Morgan will be at the First Congregational Church of Oakland, 2501 Harrison Street, on Thursday evening, 
August 30th at 7.30. There's free parking, wheelchair access at this KPFA event. This is Davey D letting you know that I'll be in conversation with Joan. So be there. Get tickets at brownpapertickets.com, Marcus Books, or other East Bay indie bookstores. For August 30th, the fire and the honey of Joan Morgan. Don't miss it. KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org.